They were up. All right, we get started. Okay, we're um, uh, you can find your place in Romans chapter nine. We left off last week, Romans nine, and we'll have a word of prayer. Father, it is for your glory we come, for your honor. We actually bless those who are with us on conference call, along with those who are joining us on Facebook. Live tonight, we're so grateful that you have given us opportunity just to share your word for your glory and honor. So be with us, O oh God, and somehow through the, this social media platform that you will cause your word to be planted in the hearts of your people. Bring forth encouragement, bring forth healing, bring forth salvation. If somebody might be reached by the gospel of Jesus Christ, we come, O oh God, to ask that you would please, O oh God, help us only say those things that are true, only say those things that your spirit would have us to say. So make our tongues as a ready writer tonight, that our tongue be able to write on the hearts of those who hear. And Father, please, O oh God, by your spirit, we need you to guide. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 All right, we um, definitely want to keep in prayer. Sharon, I just heard about Sharon. Let me just say a little prayer for Sharon Artist, Lord, that you would touch her right where she is even now, that you would touch her body. We know you're able to bring healing, restoration. We pray for Minister Bannister, who is suffering right now. Nothing is too hard for you, but we pray your mercy upon his life, and we thank you for him even now. And we commit them to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. All right. We were dealing with, we're dealing in Romans 9. Romans 9, 10, and 11 are verses, chapters that go together. And they're focusing in on Israel. All right. Paul has talked to us and given us so many rich truths concerning the church of God. But the church of God also is inclusive of those who have come out of Israel to embrace Christ. And so Paul had been accused so many times of being anti-Semitic. He had been, he had been accused of being against the Jews' religion. He had been accused by his own uh, countrymen, his own kinsmen, according to the flesh, as being against the traditions of Israel. And Paul had to defend the gospel so many times, let them know that what he's preaching has been declared from the prophets of old. The Old Testament scriptures have declared a Savior will come, a Messiah will come, and he's declaring that Jesus Christ is that Messiah. And so we have to understand from Jewish mindset what is going on here. Because the Jewish mindset has uh, at least two views I'm aware of. The Jewish mindset, uh, there's a secular portion of the Jewish mindset that says that the uh, promise of the Messiah is actually Israel themselves. Israel is the Messiah. Israel is the one that's going to break forth. There's another one, there's another um, thought that goes with the Jews that they're still waiting for, they believe Messiah is a person, not so much Israel but they believe this, they're still waiting for the Messiah to come, all right? And Paul dealt with uh, hostile uh, Jewish believers. As a matter of fact, if you remember correctly, he was one of them. He was a hostile Jewish person toward Christianity until Christ saved him. And so he's now become a proclaimer of the things that he once persecuted. And it caused him even more persecution because they felt like he had turned his back on them. But Paul takes a time out after giving us so many glorious truths about, the, about Christ and what he's done for us in salvation. He takes a time out by the God of God's spirit to now turn to his Jewish people. When he looks at Christ, he has joy. He looks at the church, he has joy. When he looks at the things of God, he has joy. But when he looks at his own people, Israelites, he has sorrow and sadness because they are in the place where he was. He has compassion for them and a love for them that even a, a greater love, we, we talked about last week, his love was so strong, he wished his stuff to be a curse from Christ. Now, and we talked about ourselves about how uh, uh, we, ha we, we have to admit that we may not be there right there. We're not, I know I'm not there. Paul was saying, I would rather take their place if they would get saved. And Moses had the same kind of heart with his people. When, when, when the Lord gave Moses those Ten Commandments, Moses came down and they were down worshiping the calf. 
And Moses threw the Ten Commandments down, the stone were written on, and he had to go to God and, and he, he had to tell God, God, um, if blot my name out, but take them, but save them, keep them in uh, Exodus 33. So Moses had the same kind of heart. And, uh, and, and Jesus on the cross had a heart because he was still praying for those who were uh, crucif crucifying him. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Then you have Stephen, the first Christian martyr, over in Acts chapter 7. He's saying, Lord, don't lay these things to their charge. What a prayer. He's been stoned by hostile Jews. He's been stoned to death. And he's praying the prayer, don't lay this to their charge. They got other things there, but don't, don't let this be counted against them. How many can pray that for your enemy? Lord, I know they did me wrong, but don't let it be laid to that charge. Amen. That's the kind of heart. I've been just finished talking to God a few minutes ago, asking God to give me his heart. Give me his mindset, because my, my mindset and my heart is so jacked up. Lord, give me your mindset. I want to love the way you love. I want to see things the way you see them. I want to rejoice the way you rejoice over things. And I want to be able to, to uh, have the kind of holy wrath and anger that he has when things aren't done his way. I want to be, I, I don't want to be selfish and an anger that's selfish and self-centered, but one that's godly. So I'm asking God to do that, for, to, to fix my heart, to fix me that way. I'm not where I want to be, but I, I believe God heard my prayer and he's working on me. Amen. Amen. How many know God's working on you? Yes. So we talked to God. Paul had that kind of heart that would wish himself a curse from Christ rather than his brother. So he had a love, a deep love for them. He had a compassionate love for them. So we see chapters 9, 10, and 11. Chapter 9 deals with Israel's past. Chapter 10 deals with Israel's present. And chapter 11 deals with Israel's future. So God is letting Israel, the Israelite, letting us know, letting the church know by writing to the Roman church, Letting us know that God has not forsaken his people. God had chose Israel. The church has not replaced Israel. Some people teach that. Some people teach that because the church, God, because God has a church, a body of Christ now, that Israel's been replaced. We are the new Israelites. But the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible teaches that God has a perfect, has a plan for them. And we have been set in as a church only for a, a period of time. To and the church is a combination of believers. Both Jew, Jew and Gentile coming together to do God's work. But God has a dispensational purpose for Israel. He's going to fulfill that. So Paul deals with that. Because you can imagine in a Jewish mindset, they will be saying, like, we, you know, we were God's chosen people. Now you're telling me the Gentiles have these promises, but we kicked out? No, Paul says, no, God forbid, this is not what we're saying. The Jews are God's chosen people. They have a purpose, and God is still saying, I'll bless those that bless him, and I'll curse those who curse them. You got to think about this now. All those people that persecuted Israel through the Old Testament, all of those groups of people, all those ites, <laughs> the, the, the Philistines and uh, all the other nations that were there, where are they now? Where are they? They're, they're not even around anymore. But yet God has preserved the Jewish people. You know why? Not because they're perfect. Not because they are above any other nation. It's his choice of grace. And how many know that that's the reason why you're saved today? It's God's elect grace. God has chosen us by his grace and mercy. All right? So if we go into the text, keep that in mind, and we'll talk a lot about Israel tonight. And we dealt with um, verses 1, 2, and 3 on last week. We'll pick up before. He begins, Paul begins to... Uh, dev out the privileges of Israel. What are the privileges of this nation? He says in verse 4, Who are the Israelites? To whom pertaineth the adoption? I'll read and I'll come back and make comment. And the glory, and the covenants, and the giving of the law, and the service of God, and the promises, whose, whose are the fathers, and of whom concerning the flesh Christ came. Who is over all, bless God forever. Amen. So we can see these are the privileges of the nation Israel. No one can take that place of them. No one can take this away from them because God gave it to them. 
the Israelites of whom pertaineth the adoption. The Israelites is, are the only night. The nation of Israel is the only nation that God has adopted. He said in um, Ephesians that he called, not Ephesians, in Exodus, that Israel was his son. He told Pharaoh, he's my firstborn son. He told Pharaoh, let my son go or I'm going to kill your firstborn son. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So God adopted them as a, as a nation. They were God's son. Since individuals, we're God's children by faith in Christ Jesus. But as a nation, they were the ones that God had adopted. So they had the adoption. No other nation was like them. And we'll see they had the adoption. They also had the glory. No other nation had the glory of God. They had the Shekinah presence of God with them. When they're in the wilderness, God led them by a, a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. That represented God's presence. God led them. When, when Moses went into the tent, the glory cloud filled that tent. When Moses went to the mountain, the glory cloud filled that mountaintop. So they had, when, when uh, uh, Solomon built his temple, the temple was filled with God's glory. They had the glory, the very presence of who God is with them. No other nation had that visible, tangible presence of God manifested in the nation. So they had the glory, the Shekinah glory of God. And uh, Paul tells us in, I think it's uh, 1 Corinthians, he tells us in the fourth chapter, he talks about that glory of God is now in the face of Christ Jesus. So that same man, that same glory that took its abode in God's tabernacle, on God's mountain, has now abides in Christ Jesus, who is God. He is the temple. He says that uh, he is that tent. The, the word became flesh. John 1 tells us the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That word dwelt means tabernacle or tented. He became the tent of God's glory. Isn't that good news? Mm -hmm. And it further goes and it tells us that we are the temple of God. Which means that now God is not dwelling in buildings. And we, we can attest to that because a lot of our church buildings are empty. Some are going out to the house of God. Some aren't. Some are, are doing the um, virtual services. But now the Bible says we are the temple of God. And Corinthians tells us that sixth chapter. We are God's dwelling. But can you imagine that God will live in us? God will live in these clay pots. God, God will bring his presence into us. He does this by the presence of his Holy Spirit. He now lives in us. We are now that temple. That's why we don't worship uh, buildings and bricks because the bricks and the building are places we meet together and they're sanctified in a sense and that's a place we worship at. But the real temple of God are his, by, are, are his believers. And we come together for lit. The Ephesians tells us that we join together a habitation for God's spirit. Isn't that good news? We come together, each person fulfilling God's design. Fulfilling God's call for their lives. Each one of us fill, uh, fulfill a brick. Each one of us are brick. And we come together. We've built a habitation for God's spirit to come in and do what he will in and through our lives. So this move that God is doing now. God, yes, God has a purpose for Israel. But God is also doing a move for the church. And he Paul said, no, they had the glory and the covenants. They had eight great covenants. Eight great covenants God gave to them. We only have a, we only siphon in on one. That's a new covenant because we're Abraham's seed. But these great covenants God made with the Israelites, they had the covenants. God made covenants in a group. We, we like it. A covenant is more than a contract because a, a covenant is relational. Because a, uh, a contract looks out for each individual party. So if I have a contract with bg and &E, I'm saying to them, you do this and I'll do that. That protects me and protects them. But in the covenant is relational. We want God wants to always be in a relation with us. He's protect, He's our protector. It's a love relationship we have. So it's more than just the only thing that describes it now is marriage. Marriage is a, uh, a covenant that we take. We agree, uh, we uh, come together, a husband and wife come together, and the two become one flesh. And it's not a contract. When my wife looks at me and says, Honey, do you love me? I don't point to my uh, marriage certificate. <laughs> and say, here's proof that I love you. Right? That's a contract. That's a paper. But she ought to see that contract written out of our relationship of mutual respect and love for each other. Amen? Amen. And a, a love for God and love for each other. So that's relational. So in a new covenant, we got to understand, when we take that bread and that, that bread and that wine or that juice together, we're going to do this Sunday morning. Uh, we have our virtual communion. 
we're, we're not we're not dealing with a contract. We're dealing with a relationship. We want our relationship. And see, the thing with a relationship is you're not trying to find out what you can and cannot do. You know, uh, people like to take things to the line. Well, can I still dance? Or can I still smoke? Or can I still drink? Can I do this? They want all these rules and regulations. But as in a relationship, you don't want anything in your life that will hinder your relationship with God. Mm-hmm. So it's not how far I can go. It's not how much I can drop it. <laughs> it's that will my dropping to bring him glory? Mm-hmm. And I don't want anything in my life that's not bringing him glory. Mm-hmm. Amen. Because my whole purpose is to bring God glory. Amen? Amen. My whole purpose is to my whole purpose of being here is not to do what I want, but to do what he designed for me. Mm-hmm. So they had the covenants, they had the adoption. They had the, the giving of the law. Moses went up to the mountain and got those commandments written with the finger of God. And even when they were broken by Moses, he was able to go get a redo. <laughs> he got those commandments on the top of Mount Sinai. Those commandments of God written there. So they had these things. They had the service of God. Not only did they have the commandments, they had uh, Leviticus uh, expressly deals with the service of the tabernacle, the temple. How you were supposed to bring the right kind of sacrifice for the particular sin. How you were supposed to serve God in order. So they had the service also of God. They had the promises. God, the Old Testament. Do y'all realize this book is a Jewish book? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Written from a Jewish perspective. Written and authored by Jews. Right? Mm -hmm. So the promises. This is why we have to understand. When we go to the Old Testament. Some promises are just for Israel. God is not telling us to go and possess, you know, Judah. Go and possess Jerusalem. He said that to them. So we read the Bible. We have to read it in light that God was talking to a particular people. We can gain application. We can gain the things that the New Testament gives authority to gain. Those things that God tells us that by faith we are the children of Abraham. Those are things we take. We are we have the blessing of Abraham on our lives, not because we were fleshly born of Abraham, but because we have been spiritually born. Abraham became a child of God. Abraham became God's child and God's servant by faith in Christ Jesus. And because we connected to him, we had the same kind of faith. We become children like Abraham was, children of God, because of our connection to Jesus Christ. So we can take those things, but we can't take everything in the Old Testament and claim it to be just ours. Be able to understand what New Testament authority do we have. I'm getting a whole nother thing. I'm teaching them hermeneutics now. But we have to understand that when we read the Bible, that every promise there, we have to find out who, when you see something in the Old Testament, you have to read that book to find out who was God talking to. What did it mean to them when he wrote, when he recorded that? And then how can I apply it to my life? All right. What did it mean then? What did it mean to the ones who God was speaking to? What does it mean now? And how can I now apply it to my life? So that's how we have to read the text. Many people go into a verse of scripture, pull one verse out, and just had a good time with it. All out of context. <laughs> not written to you. Not, not supposed to be applied that way. And we have a messed up, we have a messed up. Uh, hermeneutics, or we have a messed up interpretation, you have a messed up application. You can't apply something that you did not understand thoroughly. Mm-hmm. That's why it's important that we read the whole Bible, not just New Testament, because the Old Testament is a foundation. We're going to see as we read this text that, that when Paul was writing, there was no New Testament. The New Testament had not been written yet. So everything he's preaching is coming from the Old Testament. And so when the New Testament is written, it's written with the idea that you understand what happened in the Old Testament. And you'll see a lot of allusions to the Old Testament as we read through. A lot of Paul referring back to them because now he's speaking to the Jewish mindset, letting them know that the promises of God have not been nullified because the church is here. God still has a purpose and a plan. All right? All right. So um, the glory of the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, the promises. And verse 5 says... Um, um, whose are the fathers? They also had the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the fathers of the of the faith. All right, they had those that belonged to Israel, all Jewish fathers. God called Abraham out 
and he called him out from a, a midst of universal idolatry. He says, if you come out, I'm going to make you a particular, a peculiar people. I'm going to make you a nation. I'm going to bless those who bless you. Abraham came out and served the living God. And what God's purpose was in pulling Abraham out was not to make them an exclusive people, not to make them sit back and say, we God's chosen and we got it. You don't have it. The Israelites were supposed to be a witness to other people of how to serve a true and living God. But instead of being that witness, they lost their way and began to act like the other nations began to worship their gods and lost their distinctiveness. That's why as the church of God today, we have to be very careful that we don't lose the distinctiveness that God has called us to live. Because the world is doing one thing, the world has a mindset, we need the Bible mindset. We didn't know what God's, what does God say about it. Every situation I'll be, what does God say about it? Not how I feel, what I think, what I see. You know, we, we have to realize that our good ideas are not God ideas. Our good intentions are not, we can be zealous, we can have zeal, we can yell and scream and have passion and still be sincerely wrong. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of cultists that are out here that are sincere in what they believe, but they're sincerely wrong. And some cultists working out here knowing that they, if they will kill people, they feel like they'll be uh, rewarded with them virgins when they go to heaven. Yeah. What kind of mindset is that? That's not a godly mindset. Go to heaven. You don't need you. We won't be needing uh, opposite sex in heaven. We'll be opposite sex. We won't need each other for the procreation. It'll be that'll be no no longer needed because we're living forever. So um, and to think that that's what you think heaven is is sad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Very much because it's limiting the, the things that God has for us. God has greater things than marriage. Greater things than uh, uh, relational. Uh, a sex and these things we have on earth. He has greater things for us. These are just a foretaste of his greatness. God has great things. You can read about well, how heaven's going to look in the book of Revelation. You can read about those things and see what God has prepared. And most of all, it's not so much the streets of gold. It's not so much all the 12 gates of the city. It's not so much all the things we shall see, the beauty that God has there. The main, the main event is to see Jesus. Mm -hmm. yes, yes. Amen. Because where Jesus is, is heaven there? Amen. Amen. It's, it's not the place, it's the person. Amen. Amen. It is the person of Christ that's going to be that is most important. That where he's there is heaven. We got him, we got everything we need. Amen. All right. They had the fathers they, of whom concerning the flesh, Christ came. They had the fathers, the, the forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all the fathers, David. They had all of these patriarchs. But most of all, they had the patriarchs, and God reserved them because. They would be the one through who Christ would come. Born of a virgin Mary. Jewish. Jew, born under the law. Born uh, in the likeness of sinful flesh. Jesus Christ came in the flesh through the Israelites. So we ought to honor Jewish people and pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We ought to uh, uh, be concerned about what's happening with them because they are still God's earthly chosen when we are God's spiritually chosen. All right? They were given land and property and a certain portion of land. We've been blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. So they have a place. They have a purpose. And God has not changed his mind. We'll see that as we read on down through here. So that, that particular uh, portion of scripture gives us the privileges that God has given to Israel. And then we move down to verse 6. We have the distinction between the Jews um, that um, the, the, our natural descendants and those who are spiritual seed. This is what we have to think about. All right. And he's going to say it here now. Not as though the word of God had taken no effect. God's word is effective. God does mean what he says. I'm in verse six. For listen to this point Paul's making. For they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. He just made a statement there. Everybody born a Jew is not really a Jew in God's eyesight. So their physical distinction is not what's making them Israel. It's their spiritual distinction. We read this over, and I want to take us back a little bit. We read this earlier in chapter 2 of Romans. But now I think it'll mean more to us as we read it now, as we in this particular section. Paul alluded to what he was going to talk to, talk about in these chapters. In verse uh, chapter 2, verse 28 and 29 of Romans, he reads like this. 
For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly. Not a physical Jew. Neither is that circumcision, which is the outward of the flesh. You can be joined, be born a Jew physically and go through the rites of circumcision and still not be a Jew in God's eyesight. He explains it here in verse 29. He is a Jew, which is one inwardly. So where does the part, where is the important part is the heart, the inside. Mm -hmm. You can go through all the outward um, um, physical, physical uh, requirements and still not be Jewish in the heart. He says in this verse, but he is a Jew, which is one inwardly. And the circumcision is not, is of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter whose praise is not of men, but of God. So God is, Paul is saying, you not only need to be a, a Jew physically won't get you there, but you've got to be one in the heart, one who loves God in the heart. And the circumcision you really need is a spiritual circumcision. What God is doing operation on the inside of you. All right. Jesus said this also. You guys follow me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Jesus, and, and um, I just want to go back again to uh, John 8. I'm in Gospel of John, chapter 8. So travel with me a little bit. Keep your finger over in Romans. We're going back there shortly. But I want to see something. Because Jesus also said this. In John, chapter 8. I'm going to read a little bit, and I want y'all to listen carefully, all right? John 8. Jesus speaking. He says, someone has a TV or something on in the background. Can you um, mute your phone? Thank you. He says, I know that you are Abra Abraham's seed. This is Jesus talking to the Jews. I know that you are Abraham's seed, but you seek to kill me because my word hath no place in you. I'm sorry, 837. Did I not say it? Roman, um, yeah, John 837. John, Gospel of John, chapter 8, verse 37. I'm sorry. I thought I'd said it. I said it in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't help you guys, does it? Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> Everybody there with me? Yeah. John 837. I know that you are Abraham's seed, but you seek to kill me because my word hath no place in you. He's saying this to religious Jews who have the scripture. But he's saying you have it, but it doesn't have you. you it has no place in you. 38, he says, I speak that which I have seen with my father, and you do that which you have seen with your father. Mm. What's Jesus saying? You, we got a different father? Thing. Yeah. Mm. And they answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. They think because they're Jews, they made him a true children of Abraham. Jesus said unto them, if you were Abraham's, when he's not the seed, he says what? Abraham's children. You would do the works of Abraham. So if you were Abraham's children, if you were really his child, you would have the kind of demeaning heart Abraham had. He goes in verse 40, he says, but you seek to kill me, a man that hath told you what? The truth. the truth, which I have heard of God, as did, as this, um, this did not Abraham. Abraham didn't try to kill people who had the truth. Abraham was a love of the truth, so you can't be Abraham's children. Then he goes on, y'all ready for this? You do the deeds of your father. And they're saying, what is he talking about? Abraham's our father. Then they said unto him, we be not born of fornication. That's a jab because they, they thought, they looked at Christ as being born in, in uh, out of wedlock. We be not born of, of fornication. We have one father, even God. They saying God is their father. Jesus said unto them, if God were your father, you would love me. If you truly were connected to God, you would recognize who Jesus is. Mm -hmm. For I, he says, proceed forth and came from God. Neither came, neither came I of myself, but he sent me. The God you say is your father, I came from him. 
And he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Even because you cannot hear my word. You can't receive it. You're not able to receive the very words you study. You can't receive them. He says, you are of your father. Oh, wait, who, who your daddy? The devil. Verse 40, what does it say? Devil. You are of your father who? The devil. So he's speaking spiritually. They are physically Abraham's seed. Or Abraham, but not Abraham's children. Not like a not connected to the God of Abraham. He says, You're spiritually, your your real father, because Jesus has a way of peeling back all the layers of religiosity, all the layers of, of what man tries to uh, uh, present himself in some facade of, of holiness. He pulls the curtain back. He lets you know the emperor doesn't have any clothes on. Mm. He says, You are of your father who? The devil and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is what? No truth in him. When he speaketh the lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. No, he didn't. You mean Jesus has told these religious, pious Jews that they were not God's children. But they were children of, of the devil. So we go back now to um, Romans, where we were. And we pick up what we talked about in Romans 9. When we pick up verse 6, and I'll read it again, Romans. I'll give you a minute to get there. Romans 9 and 6. Not as though the word of God hath no effect. For they are not all Israel... Who are of Israel. So within the body of Jews. There's a true Jew. Within the collective. Uh, system of Judaism. Or Israelites. They are true Jews. Alright. The true ones are the ones that are connected to God spiritually. Not the ones that just been physically born. And the rest of these verses are going to pull us in so clearly. We get done. We're going to see it so clearly. Because Paul is going to explain it. Then he's going to illustrate it. He's giving us the facts now. There's a distinction now. He's letting know he's building up the he's building up the truth to let us know that God is not through with Israel, but he's explaining what has happened to Israel in the meanwhile. All right, we're reading about Israel's past rejection right now. We'll see the present state of them in chapter ten. All right, he says neither verse seven because you are the seed of Abraham are they are they are they all children. But in Isaac shall thy seed be called. So what is he saying in verse 7? He's pulling back to the Jewish mindset and to those who are familiar with Old Testament. He's saying that because they are the seed of Abraham, they're not necessarily the children of Abraham. Mm. All right. Then he gives a statement quoted from Genesis. In Isaac shall thy seed be called. So those of us that understand what that's going on here, Abraham had more children than Isaac. Abraham had, Abraham had a son before Isaac. Mm -hmm. He had Ishmael right. mm -hmm. by Hagar. Mm -hmm. So what Paul is saying, because you're born of Abraham, doesn't mean that you're the chosen one. Mm -hmm. You're the chosen child. Mm -hmm. Because when Hagar had Ishmael, once, once Isaac was born, God told Abraham, get rid of the bond woman and her son. Because God had chose Isaac. So he's letting them know just because you're from Abraham doesn't mean you're his real children. Y'all follow the thought? Mm -hmm. All right. Because Abraham had more than one. Now, not only did Abraham have Isaac and Ishmael, Abraham, when Sarah died, y'all got to read Abraham with something else, y'all. <laughs> he was already 100 years old when his first child was born, right? The second child, rather, was born to the Ishmael first. I think he ran in the seventies or so when he had um, um, Ishmael, but he was Ishmael was first. But not only that, when Sarah died, Abraham got married again to this person that by the name of Keturah, and he had other children. So what Paul is doing to a Jewish mindset, he's letting them know you guys know these truths. All of Abraham's children was not the seed, was not the promised seed. Mm. All right, mm -hmm. this is what he's explaining here. 
He says, and Isaac shall thy seed be called. Although you have another child, Isaac is the one who is your seed. This is the one that I've chosen. Remember Abraham tried to make, he said, Lord, I'm old, what you going to give me? I'm old. Let the, Abraham want his uh, servant to be the one inheritance go to. No, God said, Sarah is going to have a child. Mm -hmm. And I want you to call him Isaac. Because after all, Sarah laughed when she heard it. Remember Sarah was in the tent? And she was eavesdropping on God's conversation with Abraham. And when God told Abraham that he would have a child through Sarah, Sarah in the tent laughing. And God said, why is Sarah laughing? Sarah said, I didn't laugh. <laughs> and then when God finished telling all that he was going to do for um, Abraham, Abraham laughed. And God said, well, I'm going to you know, tell you something. He said, anything to hard for God? He said, I'm going to tell you what. Since you both are laughing, when this child is born, I want you to call him laughter. That's what Isaac means, laughter. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. How many know there's nothing too hard for God? That's mm -hmm. right. Amen. Nothing is too hard for God. God can turn any situation that he wants to around. Mm -hmm. God doesn't always turn everything around. But any situation he wants to turn around, he can turn around because God is sovereign. That's right. Amen. God has so much power, he's got power over his power. Amen. Amen. Y'all get that? In other words, he got the power to do what he want to do, but he also had the decision to make what he wants to do. Mm -hmm. Why he heals some and others, he take home the glory, is something we'll never know on this side. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's his plan. Jesus walked through the pool of Bethesda where the man was trying to get down there and throw himself in first because the, the angel was troubling water. The pool was full of sick people. But Jesus only healed the one man. That's right. Why did he just walk through and just heal everybody there? And sometimes he healed them all. I don't fully understand it, but God has a... All I do is know that God is sovereign. Mm -hmm. That means he can do what he... We're going to see that. We're going to face his sovereignty as we read on in these difficult passages. They're hard for us to grasp and understand but it's true about God. God has a sovereign will. God has an election in his grace. God chooses to do what he wants to do. God did not choose Ishmael. God chose Isaac. Not because Isaac was perfect, but because God wanted Isaac. He was the son of a free woman. He was the son of Sarah. That was the one God. He was a child of promise. That was the one God chose. So whatever we try to get in there and work it out ourselves, that's what Abraham and Sarah tried to do. Help God out. By giving hey God to help God out, cause all kind of family ruckus. Once once uh hey God got pregnant, then Sarah got mad and blamed Abraham. But that's what you wanted. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you asked for this child, you asked for this woman to come in, now she's looking at you like I can do something you can't do, and you're mad. Mm -hmm. But she invited this into her own house. But God has a choice, God has a sovereign choice in what he does. And I don't know about you, but I'm glad. That he chose me. Aren't you glad he chose you? Yes. yes. How do you know he chose you? Yes. If you say because yes. God chose you, not because you chose him. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. God has a choice in our salvation. I don't fully understand it. Nobody does. But I accept it because in God's word. Mm -hmm. He chose us in Christ Jesus before the foundation of the world. Amen. I accept that. All right. Verse 8 tells us this. Um, that is, he's further explaining and illustrating. What he just said, everybody born of Abraham does not belong, uh, is not the chosen seed. Because you're born of Abraham, that automatically mean they had the idea because I'm a Jew, I'm automatically in with God. Mm. That's an arrogance. Yep. I am connected to God because of my rights and because of my um, uh, um, circumcision. Because, a pri that's right, Mike, a privilege. Mm -hmm. I've got Because I'm born a Jew, that means I'm automatically in. The Jews would do that. They would thank God they weren't born a Gentile or a woman. That's how that kind of idea they had. Mm -hmm. they, would, they had the pious pride. Paul said he had that thing going on. He had everything to his advantage. And Philippians tells us he was a Hebrew of Hebrews. You know, he had all these things going for him. But when he met Christ, he realized all that stuff was nothing. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine meeting somebody that caused you to throw everything away? Meeting somebody who so changed you that it causes you to turn your back on everything you thought you were. Mm. Never the woman in the well did. She came to the well for water. But when she left, she's left the water pot right there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And tell the men in the city, she said, come see a man. 
who told me everything I ever done. Amen. So she forgot what she came for, but she got what she needed. Yes. Amen. Amen. Ain't God wonderful? Yes. Amen. God is wonderful. So you meet this Jesus Christ. You meet him. And I tell you guys that I, I for, with all my heart and all my soul, I try, if I could just inject this in people, if I could just, all I can do is tell you the best way, ask God by his spirit to help me tell it, there's nobody that can turn your life around like Christ. And not only did he save me when I was a child, he is still delivering me. He is still showing me. He is still revealing himself in my life. He is still convicting me. Because he's not a God of the past. He's a God of today. Mm -hmm. He is. He calls himself, I am. Mm -hmm. Not I was. Yeah. Not I will be. He's a I am. Yeah. Do you have the I am working in your life? Yes. He's the great I am. He's a very present help in the time of trouble. He's a God who meets our need, who come to see about us. We worry about tomorrow and what we're going to do. No, none of that stuff belongs to us. All we have is right now. And God is saying, I'm willing to enter into your space right now and be everything you need. I'll be the comfort. I'll be the shield. I'll be the healer. I'll be the protector. I'll be your provision. He told Abraham, when Abraham came off fighting all those farm people, he came out, Abraham thinking, now the people going to come after me. God says, I'm your protector. I'm your shield. When God comes up to, God says, Abraham, don't be afraid. I'm your shield and I'm your reward. Isn't that good news, y'all? Yes. Hallelujah. Mm. Amen. He said, not only will I protect you, I'm your reward. Can you imagine God saying, I'm the reward, I'm the prize. Hallelujah. Amen. We used to sing a song years ago. Thou my everlasting portion. Oh, Lord. More than friends. Some of y'all old saints know what I'm talking about. More than friends or life to me. Mm. Yeah. Yes, indeed. God is my portion. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the Levites, I know I'm going off a little. I got to flow with this thing. The Levites mm -hmm. were not given any inheritance within Israel's when they were giving out land because God said that he was going to be their portion. My Lord, mm, mm, mm. they might not. Have, they they were allowed different. They were allowed towns within the inheritance of the other people. They were never given a portion of land like the others were given. They can only uh, be placed and live on other people's land, but not have their own land because God said, "I am your portion." Amen. I wonder what you want: silver, gold, or you want God to be a portion? Amen, God. Hallelujah. I take God every time. When you got God, you have everything you need. God says, I want to be your reward. I want to be your portion. And for us to, to, to run to people and to run to man, it's an insult to God. Our first resort, and I hear people say, well, all we can do is pray. So that means I'm going to get to the end. God is like the spare tire. I only call on him when I get a flat. The last resort. He's my last resort. Mm -hmm. Well, he should be my first thought. Yes. Amen. Amen. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Right. Seek him first. Let him be that priority. Priority. We're hooked on medicines. We're hooked on uh, psychiatrists. And some of us need these kind of things. But you got to understand, when you need these kind of things, that you're not... You're not independent. You're depending on things of the world to bring you through. But you know you can depend on God. Mm -hmm. Yes. And God, he you know what God says, not love. And I think I talked to you guys about it some time ago. The Bible says that God is a jealous God. Mm -hmm. And I love that about him. That means that you got somebody who want you for himself. Mm -hmm. Yes. He mm. don't want you flirting with somebody else. <laughs> he gets jealous when he sees you trying to depend on someone else for what only he can provide. Yes, you have uh, jobs and you have checks that come in. These are all resources that God uses to bless our lives. But God is ultimately the source. So when the brook runs dry, my God. Amen. Hallelujah. Still it's time to move on to the next provision. When one source dries up, we should not be upset and worry about what God's going to do because God will make a way somehow. Amen. 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 
So they that are, I mean, verse 8, that is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as the seed. So it's not the flesh that's concerned, it's the children of promise. Isaac was a child of promise. I'm going to give you a child. He goes on in verse 9. He says this, For this is the word of promise. He refers back to Genesis. At this time I will come, and Sarah shall have a son. That's what God says. I'm going to do it. How many know God can do just what he says he's going to do? Yes, yes he can. Yes, he can. Uh, Romans 4 tells us, eight, we went through that passage, um, go, the Abraham was as good as dead. Sarah had passed menopause. <laughs> Abraham didn't have the ability to do anything. And Sarah's womb was dead. So out of death, God brought life. Mm -hmm. Out of impossibility, God brought the possible. Mm -hmm. The Bible says he was against hope. He believed in God. Wow. And God counted to him for righteousness. Mm -hmm. He goes on in verse 10. He says, and not this, um, and not only this, but when Rebecca, now he's referring now to Rebecca, Old Testament again, also conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God, according to election, might stand, not of works and not of him that calleth, but of him that calleth, brother. So, Rebecca, there's another situation. Now, we can look at Abraham and realize that Abraham had two children, but he had two different mothers. Right? And we saw that God chose Isaac as a promised seed. Mm -hmm. But here's Rebecca. Both her kids had the same father. Matter of fact, they were twins. Isaac and Jacob were twins. And when she was barren at first, Esau. I'm sorry, Esau, Isaac, and, and uh, Jacob. Right? Isaac and Jacob. Okay. And Esau, Esau and Jacob, right? Right. Okay, what did I say, Isaac? Yeah. Esau, thank you. Esau and Jacob. So when, I, when they were in the womb, when Rebecca prayed, she was barren. She asked God, and her husband asked God, and God gave them twins. And she was concerned because she felt all this commotion in her stomach. And God let her know that she was having two children, two different nations. And he told her that the, young, that the older one would serve the younger, which was contrary to tradition. Esau was the old. He came out first. Red. His name means e, called Edom. Means Esau means red. He was red and hairy. But Jacob came out holding on to his heel. And his name was meant supplanter. I mean, in other words, I'm going to take your place. You first, but I'm going to take your place. Mm -hmm. And so these two boys came out from the same woman. And God, before they were able to say mama and daddy, God had already made a choice. What did God make a choice in? God said that the, the elder would serve the younger. The elder would serve the younger, God said. So, which is contrary to what normally happens. The older son gets the double portion. The older son carries on the family name. But God said the elder is going to serve the younger. Mm -hmm. He told the mother that. He told Rebecca this was going to happen. All right? Before, and this verse 11 says, for the children being not yet born. They weren't even born yet. They were still in the womb. But yet they're called children. Right? Mm -hmm. So a child is not a child when it's birthed out. A child is a child when it's in the womb. Mm -hmm. The children not yet being born, having done any good or evil, they have opportunity to do good or right, why is this? God is letting us know that the purpose of God, according to election, which means choice, might stand not of works, but of him that calls. So God has a purpose that overrides morality. Thank you. 
the overrides the will of man, the overrides which should naturally take place. God has a, a election. God has a choice. And you and I don't have a choice in God's choice. <laughs> and choice. we can't say it should happen this way or that way because God is the one that does it. It's according, this verse says, his purpose. The purpose of God might stand not according to what someone does, but according to the one who calls. That's God. God has a choice. God is the one that calls. God is the one that brings purpose. We go back in Romans 8. He says all things work together for the good of those who are the called according to his purpose. So God's purpose is that which is important. Paul's desire was it to find out why God chose him and to fulfill that call. That ought to be our desire. To find out why it is God chose us and to fulfill that call that God has in our lives. That ought to be your passion. God, you have me here for a reason. No matter how old I am, how young I am, God has a purpose for our lives and our purpose and our, our passion ought to be, Lord, I want to walk in that purpose you called me. Let By your spirit, oh God, guide me into that purpose. I would know what that purpose is. We know the ultimate thing, the ultimate final, the finality of it is God wants to get the glory out of our lives. But how he does it is his choice. Yes. Whether it be uh, by suffering, whether it be by not suffering, whether it be by healing, whether it be by going through the fire, whether it be by, uh, uh, you know, uh, being mistreated, whatever the situation may be, God is the one that's going to get the glory. We want him to get the glory out of our lives. By life or by death, God get the glory. That's what Paul's attitude was. By life or by death. So we're going to stop here at verse 11. And I know we've been dealing with a lot of heavy, and it doesn't get any easier, y'all. It really doesn't. <laughs> That's when I told you guys, if we don't get uh, 7, 8, 9 in the prior chat, we won't have, we'll have a real hard time with 8, 9, and 10. You don't, I mean, 9, 10, 11, because they're difficult because they show us different, um, I, they show us a different, the wisdom and the depth of who God is and what he does. And he lets us know, I make a choice, and I, have, I don't have to answer to anybody about my choice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Amen. Amen. I choose because I choose. We're going to see with Pharaoh. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. The person I hard and I hard. We'll see these things happening. And he's referring back to stuff the Jewish mindset would have known. The stories that Paul is talking about that run deep into the Old Testament, into Genesis. The Jewish mindset will have known and only can say amen because Paul is talking truth. Amen. amen. He's giving the truth. All right. God bless you. Uh, any questions, comments? We have a few minutes. We'll pick up here, and I'm definitely not done with this section, but we'll pick up somewhere around here. God bless you, Facebook. God bless you, conference call. It's always an exciting time for us to get together, and in the name of the Lord, to share his precious word. I am just, y'all, I'm just on fire for him. Amen. Amen. It's a fire. Even in time, I start feeling, sometimes I get a little weary, and I get a little, I had some times I started and every time I get weary, like it's because my mind is not thinking right. When I begin to think on God and the things He's promised and things He said to do, this gives me that joy back, y'all. Don't let the devil steal your joy, Amen. Amen. I don't care what you're facing. I don't care what you're going through. God is able. Yes. Uncertainty is before us, but the God of certainty is your God, Amen. Amen. We trust Him to be in control over everything. Any questions, comments, anybody? God bless each one of you. Did you want to announce the um, I service? Give, I give to you, what service? The um, funeral. Oh, yeah. I give to you, um, if I could give you all a hug, I'd give you a virtual hug right now. We can't hug because of COVID, but I'm giving y'all a virtual hug in Christ's name. And also, um, for those who may not know, uh, my brother-in-law, I told a couple of you, my brother-in-law, Mark Horn, has passed away and... Um, I solicited your prayer for my family, and um, the arrangements are going to be virtual, so you'll be able to go on to the, and um, I'll have to send you guys the um, information, so you can go right on to your computer and follow the link to Zoom, and you'll come be able to come right in and see everything that's going to be happening. So I'll send that to you guys individually, but um, please keep my sister in prayer, because as you can imagine, she is really going through, she and her family, and she has two children. They're grown children, but you know, when your parents 
those of us that have experienced that when a parent goes, it's life is never uh, the same again. But you adjust and you live on. So, and for her to have lost a spouse, I can't even imagine what she's going through. They're together um, over. They started dating when I was um, out of high school. So in '79 they started dating. I was coming out of high school. They've been together a long time. So, um, I just solicit your prayer for her. Um, things are going on. There's difficulties up that are that are coming up in the way. She's trying to plan, and things are happening. But God is going to bring it through to make it all right. Okay, so I solicit your prayers there. All right, y'all. We have um, let's see, who we got here. Um, ooh, let's get um, Doctor Boyer once again to pray for us. Close us out in prayer. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Hearts, Thank you, Lord. Yes. yes. Yes, God. And, and every heart yes, God. You're able. You're able. Yes. Yes, God. Yes. No. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Yes. Yes, God. And we know that nothing is impossible for you, Lord. Yes, God. And you are using us for your glory, Lord. Yes, God. And nothing in this world is going to happen to us that we can still praise you. Yes, hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. We yet praise you, God. Yes, God. We yet praise you. Yes, God. Yes, you are, Lord. You are worthy. Yes. No matter how we feel, whether mm. we're sick, whether we have aches or pains, Lord God, but we're still gonna give your name. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Because can't no devil stop us from Hallelujah. praising you. Can't no sickness stop us from praising you. Yes, God. Can't no illness stop us from praising you. Can't nothing, no virus, no nothing stop us from praising you. In the midst of it, yes, we're still yes, gonna praise you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Give you the praise of God. Give you the glory, God. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And I thank you for this broadcast. I thank you. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Yes, Lord. I thank you for all of us. Yes, God. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Yes. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Yes. Yes, God. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hallelujah. Amen. amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank God.
for that heartfelt prayer. Thank God for each one of you. Thank God for you, Facebook, and those who join us by way of Facebook Live. We're so grateful those on conference line. We're grateful. Keep serving the Lord. Keep serving the Lord with all your might. God bless you. Good night, everybody. Have a blessed, blessed weekend. All right. God bless you. Amen. Amen.